Hello and welcome to today's message. Today we are commemorating Palm Sunday. Now Palm Sunday is sometimes also known as Passion Sunday and it's a time in the Christian calendar that really marks the start of the week where we commemorate Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And the reason we mark out this day is we remember the passages of scripture uh, that we have in the New Testament in the gospel accounts that describe Jesus's entry into Jerusalem for the final time. And this is significant because he entered into Jerusalem knowing what was going to happen to him, knowing that uh, he was never going to leave Jerusalem uh, uh, until after he had been crucified and had risen from the grave. And of course, this is a, a very key time in the Christian calendar. Uh, for us, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. Um, it's a key moment, not just for Jesus Christ, but it's a key moment for all of humanity. It's a key moment for you and for me. Now, I put up a, a picture here that shows uh, you know, one of the standouts of the image of this moment when Jesus Christ enters into Jerusalem for the final time. Uh, part of it is that he rides in as a donkey and uh, they're waving these palm leaves around him. But more than that, it's the way that they greet him. Uh, they greet him as if he was a king. And, and if you read the scriptures that describe this event, they talk about how Jesus was doing this to fulfill what scripture said about the Messiah. And so looking back after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they understood more of what was going on. But let us read a little bit uh, from the Gospel of John uh, regarding these um, events. So this is John 12 and verse 12, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and this is what it says here. The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast, that is the Passover feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now, these terms that are used here are in many ways quite loaded terms. Uh, the phrase there, King of Israel, that we read in John chapter 12, uh, uh, of course, later on is used against Jesus. Uh, the charge that is leveled against him by the Jewish leaders is that he was calling himself the king of the Jews. And in doing so, he was saying that he was higher than Caesar. And this is actually what Pilate interrogates Jesus about. And when Jesus Christ is crucified, there's a sign above his cross that says king of the Jews. And of course, this was used uh, in a form of mockery, that this was somebody who was claiming to be a king. And yet the reality was that he wasn't a king. Uh, on the contrary, they're saying, uh, look at how he died. He died like a criminal. But one of the really interesting things is that for so many Christians, myself included, but so many Christians throughout the ages, the significance of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross means so much to us because Jesus Christ was a king. He is a king. He is the king of kings. And truly understanding what he gave up for you and for me and what he accomplished through the cross is such has such huge impact upon us. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture that the Apostle Paul wrote that talks specifically about what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And uh, this is sometimes known as the Christ hymn. And the reason it's known as the Christ hymn is that many scholars, when they read through the uh, Apostle uh, Paul's work, uh, they try to work out what is the inspiration for what he wrote uh, in his letters. Was it from Old Testament scripture? Was it from the gospel accounts? Uh, uh, what was Paul using when he created his letters? And of course, he has his own experience, uh, his own encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, uh, which he references at various points. But when people have read through the uh, uh, letter to the church in Philippi, uh, one of the things some people have theorized is that uh, part of that letter actually comes from an old Christian hymn. And what Paul is doing is quoting the hymn uh, with the assumption that the Philippians would be able to recognize it. Now, there are challenges with this. We don't know whether it's a hymn or a poem. Uh, if it's a, a hymn, there's no musical piece that anybody has uh, ever associated with it, to my knowledge. 
Um, but more than that, this isn't something that is known for sure. Uh, this is just a, a hypothesis, and there are reasons why some people think it's true, and there are reasons why other people don't think it's true. But I think one of the things that this part of Scripture, which is known as the Christ hymn, has, uh, is it's a, a particularly beautiful passage of the Scripture that does a great job of kind of summarizing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I think one of the reasons why this has been a standout passage is because of that. And the fact that it, it, it has a name associated with that, I think, helps in terms of people being able to find it and return to it. But it's certainly a very popular passage of scripture but it's also one that's very helpful for us to read and to reflect upon as we approach this key moment in our, 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 our annual worship cycle uh, as we approach our commemoration of Jesus Christ's death on the cross for us and of course uh, the glorious news of his resurrection on Easter Sunday. So let us turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Now what I'm going to do in this uh, uh, sermon today is I'm going to look at this passage in uh, different uh, translations of the Bible. And as we read through different translations of these Bible, different aspects of it are going to jump out on us. Uh, but there are key things as we go through it that I want to kind of highlight. Uh, but one of the things in particular is we're going to read through it first now in the English Standard Version. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through it all and then we'll go through it in more depth in other translations. Now the reason for this is I want you to have a kind of overview of what Paul is saying in this passage of scripture uh, so that we have the overview that can help inform us when we stop at moments along it to reflect about the specifics of what Paul meant. So this is what he writes, Philippians 2 chapter 5, speaking to the church in Philippi. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this is a, a beautiful passage of scripture that, that, that kind of really gets to grip with the gospel message in, you know, the kind of overview of the gospel message. What is it that Jesus Christ did for you and me? What did he accomplish through the cross? And we have this idea that, that, that Jesus Christ is God, and yet he didn't count on his divine rights. Instead, he came in the form of a servant, and he was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. And through his death, it changed everything. And so now God has highly exalted him above every other name all to the glory of God the Father. So the first translation I want to look at is the Amplified Translation. I want to go back through this in the Amplified Translation. Now, if you haven't used the Amplified Translation before, it's really a translation that is designed to help us understand a little bit more about the, the words that are used uh, when they're making the translation. Because, of course, the words that we are reading were uh, originally written in Greek by Paul or whoever wrote uh, the letter for Paul. And uh, for many years, that was the language in which they existed. And now they have been translated into many different languages. And of course, English is one of those languages. Uh, but whenever you make a translation, there are slight variations as different translators try to capture the meaning uh, of the words, because there isn't an always uh, a one-to-one -one translation. Uh, for example, one word in Greek uh, doesn't always have a corresponding word in English. And sometimes in English, there might be multiple words that correspond to what the word 
in Greek meant. And this is part of the challenge of translating any language, uh, but of course it affects the Bible as well. And that's why we have multiple translations in English. Uh, we're trying to do the best translation we can, and English is an evolving language itself. If you go and read some of the uh, older translations, uh, the King James Version is a very popular one. One of the things that will strike you is, is the use of English words which we don't use very often. And uh, often we can think about them in a in a very Christian context. Um, Thy will be done is, you know, a phrase that that uh, uh, many Christians will know. But of course, uh, the the thy isn't how we address people. I don't go around regularly using that. Uh, that's been changed in, in in modern English. We don't use that. Maybe in a Shakespeare play, but even Shakespeare plays are often updated so that people don't have to stumble. Uh, over the language in the same way. But the Amplified Bible, one of the things it tries to do is it has sections in brackets and it uses uh, square brackets at certain points and it uses uh, curved brackets at others. Uh, when it's in square brackets, these are parts that aren't in the original Greek text that the translators have added in to try and help uh, explain the meaning a little bit. Uh, where there are brackets and they are curly brackets. Uh, they're there because the Greek word doesn't translate exactly into English, and by including another English word, it can help us to have a better understanding of what the Greek word uh, really means. So it's quite a interesting Bible to use um, as you go through it. Uh, there are pros and cons to this, because sometimes the things in square brackets can lead you uh, to think a certain thing that perhaps is just something that the uh, translators feel to be the case, as opposed to necessarily is. So there, there are definitely pros and cons. Uh, but it can be very helpful when we read just to spark in our mind uh, s some of the concepts that uh, Christians through the ages have taken away from uh, Scripture. So Philippians 2, 2 and starting in verse 5. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. So one of the things the Amplified Translation does a really good job of bringing out to us in this passage is this idea that what Paul is trying to get across is that Jesus Christ is an example for us in the way that we should live, the way in which we should approach the relationships in our lives, the way in which we should approach every aspect of our life. And the example of Jesus Christ is one that stands out because of Christ's humbleness and his humility, which was this, this, this characteristic of Jesus Christ that uh, for the Apostle Paul was an essential one, as we're about to see as we continue reading through this passage. Uh, this idea that Jesus wasn't somebody who was obsessed with status, but rather came from a point of view of humility. And it's quite interesting when we think about uh, the problems in the world today. Uh, I have three young children, and uh, one of the things you notice very on with the young children is when they want something, they will let you know. And this starts at a very early age. You know, when something's wrong with a baby, they can't uh, communicate it very well themselves. Uh, they can't do very much themselves. And so what do they do? They cry in the hopes that uh, their parent will do what they want, will supply them with whatever it is they need or desire at that moment in time. And in some ways, that behavior continues for the rest of our life. Uh, often there are things that we want and we desire. And as human beings, I think we all know that we can at times be very selfish individuals. Uh, sometimes what we want is, you know, the focus of everything. Uh, you, 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 you hear of people whose entire approach in life is about fulfilling their needs and they don't seem to care about how their actions affect others and the reality is all of us at some point in our life will have exhibited exhibited that kind of selfish behavior that behavior where we put our needs and wants and desires ahead of those around us it's interesting i was listening to a podcast just this week about uh, the Titanic 
And, and many know the Titanic was a, a ship that sank a number of years ago. And of course, it was this terrible tragedy. And it was this terrible tragedy because there weren't enough lifeboats and so many people died at sea. But the tragedy was made worse by the fact that when the lifeboats were being put out, the decision was made uh, that women and children should go first. And one of the challenges you had at this time was on the Titanic, on either side of the ship, uh, there were two people in charge of loading the lifeboats. And on one side of the ship, uh, the person viewed this order as meaning that uh, when it came to letting the lifeboats down into the water, the only people who could enter the lifeboats were women and children. On the other side of the ship, the other person interpreted this order as to mean women and children were first to go into the lifeboats, and if there wasn't uh, uh, any other women and children, then men could be led on to the lifeboats. Uh, but the reality of what happened there is, despite not having enough lifeboats, the real tragedy, uh, or, or a further tragedy, uh, was the fact that the Titanic's lifeboats, so many of them went out with spare capacity. So many of them were not filled on both sides of the ships. Uh, but it was worse on the side where the person was only letting women and children on the boat, uh, because there are a lot of people People who were fearful about going into the water, a lot of people who hadn't made it to the deck yet, and the boats had to be released so that that way they could get the next lifeboat ready to be released as well because they were working against the clock and uh, they couldn't just hang around for everyone necessarily to be filled because that would be a real challenge for the later lifeboats. But as I was listening to this story, it really struck me about what would I do in those circumstances? What would uh, my friends and family do in those circumstances? How would you handle a similar situation? And there were moments uh, uh, that have been recorded of people making you know, uh, great sacrifices, but there are also people when it came to the Titanic who have been condemned because they seem to be more interested in their own needs and their own survival than uh, those of others in the ship. And so it's a, it's a really mixed bag you have the more that uh, uh, you find out and study the story of the Titanic. Uh, but it's very relevant here because when we think about how we approach things, do we have a, a humble approach or are we somebody who's maybe more aggressive about making sure our needs are met or the needs of others who we care for and love are met, even if it's at the expense of others? The really interesting thing, of course, is the example that Christ gives us. And the example Christ gives us is this, this beautiful, beautiful story of somebody who doesn't cling on uh, to the powers and the luxuries that are around him, but instead gives it all up for us, for you and me, so that we can have salvation through the blood he sheds on the cross. So, let us keep reading. So, let us have the same mind uh, which was in Jesus Christ, who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, is what the Amplified Bible says here, did not think this equality with God was something to be eagerly grasped or retained. So here, what the Amplified Bible does is it tries to give a little bit more detail about what it means that Jesus was in the form of God. Uh, because that terminology can be a little bit confusing to us. But really what it's talking about is that God possessed the fullness of the attributes which made God, God. Uh, you know, Understanding that is critical to understanding the gospel story. And it's interesting that uh, there would have been many examples at the time that uh, Greek readers in particular, but even Jewish readers would have been aware of, of where human beings had been declared to be God. Um, Alexander the Great was a, a good example of this. And when he died at a fairly young age, a kind of similar age to Jesus Christ, uh, one of the things that was declared of him was that he was a god. And um, in fact, this is something that he actually said of himself at one point. And he was somebody who achieved a great deal uh, in his short time. But I think most people would question whether he really was a god. And of course, this was something that would have been even more familiar in Roman terms because uh, uh, Caesar Augustus 
uh, uh, was known as a god because of what he did for the Roman Empire um, at the time. And of course, there were cults dedicated to worshipping uh, the imperial gods, the Roman uh, Caesars who had become gods at the time. But one of the fundamental differences here is it's not a case of a human being becoming God, but really what Paul is describing is how God became a human being like one of us, how Jesus Christ took on flesh. He's talking about what we call in theology the incarnation, that God came as one of us. He came born of Mary, uh, 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 fully human like you and me. So he was God, he had the fullness of God, but he didn't consider that as something that he needed to to grasp, to hold on to. So you had all these, <laughs> these Roman emperors who were desiring to be God, but in Jesus Christ we have God who, who willingly gives up and does not exercise his divine rights and his divine attributes and comes in the form of a servant. And this is what is picked up in verse 7 of the Amplified Translation. But Jesus Christ stripped himself, and this is what it says is meant by that, of all privileges and rightful dignity. So this is the idea that, that God, the creator God, if he came to this world, he should have all privileges and, and nobody should have more dignity than him because he is the creator God. But here in the story of Jesus Christ, it's not the king, uh, it's not a human being who went on to become king, but rather it's the king who comes in the guise of a servant. So this is what it continues. So as to assume the guise of a servant. And here we have the curly bracket saying slave, because that word servant is really could very easily be translated as slave. And sometimes when we use the word servant, we almost sanitize uh, the understanding of that expression. Now, slavery in biblical times was different to our context of slavery in modern times, but it wasn't a positive by by any means. People who try and create this rosy picture of slavery, that's not accurate uh, uh, in biblical times. Uh, it would have been a hard life to come in the form of a servant, a slave. But but what is being talked about here? Well, it's talking about how Jesus Christ gave up everything and he came as a human being and he allowed himself to be subjected to human authority, which we see at various points in the gospel account. Uh, and it continues by saying in that he became like man and was born a human being. So it's quite explicit in this. And then it continues by saying, and after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself. And then it's got in square brackets still further saying that, you know, this is, it, it gets, it gets even more incredible when we think that Jesus Christ humbled himself and carried out his obedience, even to the point of extreme death, even the death of the cross. So it's saying that Jesus Christ, he lived a life of obedience to God the Father. And he humbled himself by accepting even the extremes of death, of execution, uh, at the hands of the Jewish leaders, at the hands of the Roman authorities who ordered his crucifixion, at the hands of the crowd who chose that Jesus be the one who is executed over Barabbas, despite his innocence, despite uh, the charges against him not being fair. And then it continues by saying, therefore, because he stoops so low, because of his humility, because he willingly chose the cross so that you and I can have freedom, God has highly exalted him, highly exalted Jesus, and have bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That in, and again, this is brackets at, representing that, that the in could also be understood in English as at. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And again, the Greek word, the Amplified Translation highlights here, is stronger than in English just the word should has on its own. So it's, it's implying that at the name of G Jesus, you know, every knee must bow. It's, 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 it, it, there's more of a, an inevitableness about it than the word should implies in English, uh, in the original Greek. Uh, 
And then it says that this is the case in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue frankly and openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so here it's saying because of what Jesus Christ did, uh, the name of Jesus is being exalted, and the time is coming when everybody will acknowledge that, uh, whether they are in heaven, whether the, 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 the angels in heaven, or whether it's human beings and the creatures of the earth, or whether it's even, uh, uh, you know, the forces under the earth. Uh, you know, this idea that it covers everything, that everyone will recognize who Jesus Christ is, will recognize his authority, and every tongue, frankly and openly, will confess. You know, there won't be any hesitation in confessing and acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so the reality of what's being described here is the exaltation of Jesus is an exaltation that people like Alexander the Great and Augustus could only ever dream of. Uh, this idea that every person in all of creation, every creature in all of creation will acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. This is the incredible picture. So we have Jesus Christ who was God, who is God, who gave that up for you and me and took on human form, who came as a servant, as one who's coming to serve us so that we can be saved. And he was obedient even to the point of death. And the wrongness of that death cannot be overstated. Uh, the wrongness of Jesus Christ's death. Because the reality is, is that the Creator God was never meant to die. The reality is us as human beings were never meant to die. Uh, we were made in the image of God. And it's only through the fall, through human sin, that we suffer the consequence of death. We were made in the image of God to be image bearers of God. We weren't meant to die. Yet the reality is that is the consequence of our sin, of humanity's sin, of your and my sin. And Jesus Christ accepted that consequence of our sin and gave his life for us on the cross. And it wasn't just death, an ordinary death. No, it was the death of a criminal. The death on a cross, this incredibly painful and difficult way to die. And from that, God the Father has exalted him up to the highest position there could ever be. I want to read this again, this time moving on to our third translation, uh, which is the Passion Translation. And this is what it said. And consider the example that Jesus, the Anointed One, has set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. Now, what I like about the Passion Translation, and the Passion Translation is much more of a paraphrase. And what do I mean by that? Well, it means that when they're translating from the Greek to the English, uh, what they're trying to convey is what they feel the meaning of the Greek is more than a word-for-word -word translation of Greek to English. Um, and so this is very much a paraphrase. So it's a little bit looser. Uh, with the text than the English Standard Version, in some cases maybe even quite a bit looser than the English Standard Version or the Amplified Version that we've just read. Uh, but one of the things it does is it can help bring out some of the, uh, particularly the emotive aspects of, of the wording, and it's easier to kind of capture some of the beauty and the poetry uh, that is there in the Greek and is sometimes lost when we move it into the English. But here it says, consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one. Now, the Passion Translation often translates the word Christ, the anointed one, because that's literally what it means. Uh, it, it, it means the anointed one. Uh, it's the Greek word for the anointed one. And uh, by reminding us of us, it helps us to see Christ as a title more than we see it as a surname, uh, which in English is very common. You know, everybody should have at least two names. Uh, uh, I'm Gavin Henderson, so Jesus should be Jesus Christ. But really, Christ is a title. It's the title that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And so Christ is another word for Messiah. 
um, and uh, are literally translated, it's the anointed one. Because in the Old Testament, uh, the key figures were anointed with oil for their position. So here it says, and consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. And I love the way that this describes having the mind of Jesus Christ, which is what the other translations say. Let us have the mind of Jesus Christ. And of course, we want to have the mind of Jesus Christ, but the way it's expressed here, I think is helpful for us. Let Jesus Christ's mindset become your motivation. Let us try and see the world through the mind of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that as Christians, maybe we don't even do that enough. Even when we're arguing with other Christians, do we stop and think to ourselves, you know, how can I put myself in the position of Jesus Christ? How do I have the mindset of Jesus Christ in this argument or this discussion or this debate that's going on, whether that's in my church or in my family or in my office or wherever it may be, or if it's a debate in the political spectrum, how can we have the mindset of Jesus Christ? And of course, that mindset is revealed in what Paul goes on to say. So let's read it in the, trans, uh, in the Passion Translation. Jesus existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. I like that version of it because it talks about the fact that for so many people, they're always aiming to, to, to have the best, you know, and, and, and really society encourages that. We look at adverts and, uh, you know, the adverts are full of people living these luxury lifestyles and having these fancy houses and these fancy cars. And this is, this is the dream, the American dream, people might say, that, that anybody can come along and make it big. And we view making it big in terms of material possessions, in terms of, of, of what we have and the luxury we can surround ourselves with. But here, the way the Passion Translation describes it is if we look at Jesus Christ, he wasn't looking to seize equality with God as his supreme prize. He wasn't looking for his own self-interest. And really, this is, this is at the root of human sin and the fall. You know, what was Adam trying to do when he ate of the fruit? He wanted to have knowledge of good and evil like God. He wanted to be like God. He wanted that supreme prize of seizing equality with God. And what was the result of that? Well, it's sin and death. But here the Passion Translation continues by saying, instead of trying to seize equality with God as his supreme prize, instead he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of the lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable. The creator of the cosmos, the creator of everything that we see, became vulnerable. He was able to be hurt the way that you and I are hurt, to suffer the way that you and I suffer. So he humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. What do we mean by obedient? Obedient to God. He desired what God wanted. He made God's will his will. And he was, as it describes here, a perfect example. Even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. So at every moment, Jesus Christ was a perfect example for us. Even his death on the cross. Continuing in verse 9, because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. So because of this, uh, uh, you know, he has been exalted to the highest place so that his authority, the authority of the name of Jesus, causes every need to bow in reverence. Nobody can avoid acknowledging Jesus Christ 
uh, who he is. This is what this is saying. This is what is coming. This is the exaltation that has happened when Jesus Christ came to the right hand of the Father. And it's one that isn't fully revealed yet, but it will be at Jesus Christ's return. And everything and everyone will one day submit to his name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm. That's how it interprets this faith that under the earth, everybody will know. The idea that there won't be anybody who will not acknowledge the supremacy of God because of what Jesus Christ accomplished through the cross. And every tongue will proclaim in every language. I love that idea that, you know, every tongue uh, and, and capturing that idea that all these different languages we have around the world will be united in that time. And where will that unity come from? From Jesus Christ, by declaring Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord Yahweh, it says, a reference to uh, uh, the way that in the Old Testament, the reference to Yahweh is often expressed in English as Lord. And bringing glory and honor to God, his Father. So as we see in that translation that we have there, we have this beautiful language to describe what is known as the Christ hymn. And I love all three of those translations. I think all three bring out something that is uh, uh, useful as we read those scriptures. But I think it really is beautiful that we in English at the moment have the opportunity to compare different translations, to pick up on different nuances that are expressed in the Greek that are maybe lost uh, uh, when we move over to the English. Uh, but when we think about what we are commemorating this week, as we think about Jesus Christ entering into Jerusalem and how people held him as a king, it's so important for us to understand who Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God. He is the creator of everything that we see. And when he entered into Jerusalem that final time, he entered in the form of a servant. He entered as a human being like you and me, as our great high priest. And the sacrifice that he made on the cross, which we will remember this week, which we will commemorate this week, he made for you and for me. And despite so many people thinking that his death on the cross was the end, it's not. It wasn't the end. And it wasn't a defeat. On the contrary, it was a tremendous victory. The victory. The victory over all the forces of evil. The victory over death itself. Because death could not hold Jesus Christ. And so he rose from the grave and he is at the right hand of the Father. And the time is coming, the time that we long for as Christians, when the whole world, when the whole of creation, when everybody will acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. And so in your week this week, don't wait until Jesus Christ returns. Start now. Acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord in your life. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the good news that we have in him. Father, please help us to always come before you and acknowledge who you are, Lord. Father, we ask that you help open our eyes to the glory of your Son, the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, the glory of what he did for us, Lord, that he took on flesh, that he became our brother, Lord, that he took on our sinful fallen flesh, Lord, and he led a life of perfect obedience to you. And he did this for us, Lord. He did this so that through his death, his wrongful death, his painful death on the cross, Lord, our sins have been forgiven and we have been given new life, eternal life in him, Lord. So, Father, let us be those in creation who rise up, Lord, declaring that Jesus is King. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, please just give us that spirit in our hearts, that spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ is our Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the one who is worthy of worship because of what he has done. 
So please be with our commemorations and celebrations this week as we focus on Jesus Christ. And I ask that you encourage everybody who's listening to this and inspire them to seek you out in, in, in all things and at all times, Lord. And I say this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you so much for joining me for uh, uh, this message today. Uh, we will be back uh, next Sunday with another message. Uh, if you're interested in a Monday Thursday service, we are having a Monday Thursday service on Zoom and you can access more details on our church website, www.gracecom.church. Uh, so that will be this coming Thursday. And of course, we'll be back next Sunday uh, for an Easter message. So please do join us then. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you.